Hello there, very good evening and welcome to your Prime Time News Bulletin. I'm Shane Silva. I'm Stephanie Lazarus. Before we go into your stories in detail, let's take a look at the headlines tonight. Deadline for Supreme Court to provide an opinion on whether there are constitutional impediments to the president seeking a further term in office expires. Several main opposition political parties on one platform on a common consensus including the abolishment of the executive presidency. Kostlander search operations comes to an end. MP Sudin Handudneti expresses his disappointment over the budget allocation for women. <laughs> On to your top story tonight, key opposition political parties and several civil society organizations laid the groundwork today for a joint program on the basis of common goals, including the abolition of the executive presidency and the reinstatement of the 17th Amendment. A joint media briefing was held in Pitakote today with the participation of the key stakeholders to this endeavor. The convener of the National Movement for Social Justice, Venerable Madhulwave Sobita Thera, opposition leader Rani Vikramasinghe, Democratic Party leader Sarath Fonseca, and frontline leaders of several political parties participated at this media briefing. Several civil society groups, including the University Teachers for a Just Society Movement and the Free Media Movement, were also represented at this media briefing. <laughs> In which country do they have a constitution that has been rejected by the country? The entire country is united in calling on the president, who has two more years in his term, to abolish the executive presidency and transfer executive powers to parliament as promised. If this government does not fulfill this demand, then at the upcoming presidential election, in order to have a common victory for the people, we will put forward a common opposition candidate acceptable to all, while maintaining the agendas of the individual political parties and work towards the victory of the policy rather than the individual. Abolishing the executive presidency, reinstating the 17th Amendment and changing the electoral system. We are all preparing to put forward a common candidate accepted by all with the promise that this task will be completed in six months and that power will be transferred to Parliament. This government is the people. It consists of the Sama Samaja Party, the Communist Party and the Democratic Front. Many who raise their hands against this constitution are in the government. We invite all of them to join with us. We did not have a common program. This symbolic meeting marks an agreement on a common platform and we are going to take the next step. We have all agreed, in addition to the abolition of the executive presidency and the formation of a government accountable to parliament, to reinstate the 17th Amendment and introduce a proportional and first-past-the-post system to replace the preferential voting system. Our first attempt to abolish the executive presidency will be through parliament and through the government. If this can be done through the draft 19th Amendment, then we should adopt it. If this does not happen, then we will need to think about the next step. If we do not demonstrate and demand a free and fair election, our collective will not be successful. The president knows that the only way to suppress public will is to use the state mechanisms to use government power and state finance to ensure that it will not be a free and fair election. A presidential election does not mean deciding on whether the incumbent president should be given a mandate as per public will or not. What should be questioned here is whether the state mechanism and limitless power can be used to change the result of the election. If we are going forward as a collective, if we are to put forward a common candidate, then we must know all of these things. We are prepared to take to the streets to uphold the people's power. It is much better to take to the streets before an election and ensure these rights than to take to the streets after an election. The policy of our party at present is not simply the abolition of the executive presidency, but that its limitless power is harmful to the country. Powers have been granted in order to work in the interest of the country. The problem in our country is that although powers have been vested, they are not used in the best interest of the country. The president works for his own interest. That is why we say that there must be a referendum on whether it should be abolished or not. As a person who has experience being the common candidate, I can say that coming forward as the common candidate is similar to walking towards the gallows. It is a life and death battle. You could lose everything. When you are the candidate, everyone flocks around you. But when the job goes wrong, there is nobody. When you are imprisoned, you are alone. 
So I say to the person who accepts the challenge of being the common candidate that because of the political culture and the mentality of our politicians, this cycle could be repeated. If the wrong person is chosen, our party will not pledge ourselves. We must definitely look into the person's history, their competence, their mentality, their character credence and their commitment to the country. We can only rally around a candidate if these conditions are fulfilled in keeping with our conscience. Former President Chandrika Banda Nayaka Kumar Thunga issued a special statement on the occasion of this meeting, which was read out at the media briefing. I hold in high esteem the goal of having broad-based changes to the political culture and governance in our country. It has been stated that the common vision of the powerful collective that arose today is the abolition of the executive presidency, the re-empowerment of the 17th Amendment, democratic governance and the empowerment of the rights of the citizenry. I believe that this new collective has the strength and courage to bring forth humaneness, democracy, respect for human rights and an ethical society. I extend my fullest support and my blessings to this collective and extend my best wishes. My personal opinion is that incidents in the past should be considered at depth and without digging up history, we must leave aside individual agendas and adopt a common agenda for the country. This is where we can do it. What matters to us more than the person is the road that will be taken. I believe we have come to a position today. I have come here to make a policy decision and to forge ahead with the policies rather than decide on the person. For more of the views expressed at this media briefing, tune in to the main news bulletin at 10 p.m. tonight on our sister channel, Sirisa TV. The deadline granted by the President for the Supreme Court to provide an opinion on whether there are any constitutional impediments to him seeking a further term in office expires today. On the 5th of November, the President submitted two questions to the Supreme Court. Whether there are any impediments on him, the incumbent President, when the 18th Amendment was adopted, from seeking a further term of office after the conclusion of four years since assuming office in his second term on the 19th of November 2010. And whether, as the incumbent President serving his second term of office when the 18th Amendment came into effect, there are any impediments to him being elected for a further term of office. The two questions were considered at the Chief Justice's chambers today by a bench comprising of Chief Justice Mohan Piris and Justices K. Sri Pavan, Chandra Ekanayaka, Priyasad Dep, Eva Vanasundara, Rohini Marasinghe, Buanaka Aluvihare, Sarad Diabru, Sisira Diabru and Priyanta Jayawadna. 38 written submissions had been made to the Supreme Court arguing for the positive and the negative responses to the two questions posed by the President. <laughs> When the opinion of the Supreme Court was sought on the matter, the Honorable Chief Justice invited the membership of the Bar Association where all lawyers are represented to make written submissions. A large number of requests had been made. I too submitted a written submission in which I noted that there is no impediment whatsoever on the President seeking a third term of office when his second term concludes. <laughs> There are no legal impediments on the President seeking a further term of office since the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. Strikes of Articles 31A, 31.2 and 92C. We have informed the Supreme Court of this in writing. Convening a media briefing today, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka noted that an opportunity must be provided for oral submissions to be made in open court. The Bar Association believes that this should be subject to an open dialogue. The Bar Association is disappointed and saddened by the lack of openness. I believe that the opinion will be informed to the President in private. We will not be able to know what the opinion is. The problem that arises here is that it is only these judges that will participate in this matter when it is taken to court. The same judges who provided the opinion. So there's a grave doubt as to whether they are capable of pronouncing a different opinion. <laughs> Registrar of the Supreme Court, Mahesh Jayasekara, noted that the matter would be discussed in private and that the justices have till midnight to provide their conclusion to the President.
Deputy Leader of the UNP Parliamentarian Sajid Premadasu says that the constitution has become the private property of leaders of the country. He made this statement at an event held in Tissamaharama today. What has happened to the country's constitution? The constitution has not been implemented for the welfare of the country. The constitution has now become the personal property of the leaders. Today there is no rule of law in the country. The law of the jungle is what has been implemented today. The constitution has been implemented for the welfare of the leaders and not the people. He expressed these views in an event to distribute drinking water to those who have been affected by the drought in Osuvinna Tissamaharama. President Mahindra Rajapaksa says that the first gunshot fired against terrorism was for the farmers of the country. He made this statement at a meeting organized for farming associations and representatives at Temple Trees. The presidential media unit stated that a meeting was held for officials and representatives belonging to farming associations from all provinces, including the north and east, under the theme Dasavasara Kapiya Satahan for those who have engaged in farming for more than 10 years. We are not ready to reverse a country that is moving forward. When the Mavilaru Anikat was closed, why did we deploy armed forces to supply water to the farming community? They blocked the Anikat and stopped the flow of water. We deployed the armed forces to protect the farmlands of these farmers. That was the first call we made. From there we moved forward and before long brought an end to the fighting. Meanwhile, a group of members from the Upcountry People's Front and political groups visited the president yesterday to extend their fullest support in the upcoming presidential election. The presidential media unit noted that amongst the group were Shanti Devi Chandrasekharan and V. Radhakrishnan. Speaking at a meeting with rice mill owners in Polonaro this morning, Minister Maitripala Sirisena made the following statement. I remember that in the 90s I took the small rice mill owners in Polonnaruwa to meet President Chandrika Kumaratunga. As the finance minister, Madam Chandrika Kumaratunga listened to them and granted relief. I do not think that any person or any government has given that much relief since then, as far as I remember. I must note that it was I that reformed the Paddy Marketing Board for the second time as the Agriculture Minister. In 1999, a proposal was brought to Parliament to annul the Paddy Marketing Board. The Paddy Marketing Board was closed down under the UNP government when Dharmadasa Banda was the Agriculture Minister. When Minister DM Jayaratna was the Agriculture Minister, a bill was brought to Parliament to abolish the Paddy Marketing Board. As a government minister at the time, I worked to defeat that bill. In 2006, amid much difficulty, I brought forward the proposal to re-establish the Paddy Marketing Board. Many did not cooperate with me. Even though we were in government, the board was not appointed and the paddy was not purchased for a whole year. From 2007, the paddy marketing board began purchasing paddy. In 2010, when I left the agriculture ministry and became minister of health, the paddy marketing board was not in debt to the treasury, the government or anyone else. The state of the paddy marketing board today is very disappointing. I know that the paddy marketing board has a large debt burden. You may think that I have not come to meet you since I secured relief for you in the 90s because my brother owns a large paddy mill. I do not have paddy mills or hotels. I do not have shares in any of these things. Whenever a problem arises, I am in the midst of the people. Let's now take a look at Crime Watch. A group of thieves who stole rupees 300,000 from a business establishment in Paduka last evening fled the scene after firing gunshots. The manner in which they broke into the shop was captured on a CCTV camera installed in the vicinity. The police stated that the two thieves who had carried out the crime in a shopping complex in Wataraka Paduka are reported to have arrived in a motorcycle and later fled the scene after having stolen a stash of currency. After a period of three days, police were able to discover the van believed to have dragged a body from Navalapiti to Gampala, which is 17 kilometers in distance. They were able to identify the van after a security camera along the roadside captured the incident. The body was found on a road located in close proximity to a public market in Gampala on the 6th of this month. 
Police stated that the van had been hired out at the time of the incident. A suspect connected to the murder of the university student in Matale has been arrested by the Criminal Investigations Department. Police media spokesperson SSP Ajitrona stated that two teams of the Criminal Investigations Department were deployed to apprehend the 33-year-old suspect. He added that the victim received a blow to the head whilst she was asleep, murdered and later raped outside her house. Her body was found behind a strawberry located 150 meters away from her residence. A 23-year-old girl and an external undergraduate of Eradhini University had been brutally killed and raped in Varapiti in Matale police area a couple of months ago. Then thereafter, the local police and a special team of Candy conducted the investigation, but the suspect was not raised. Then thereafter, CID took out the investigation and yesterday the suspect in connection with the crime has been arrested and he is a famous criminal in the area. He had been involved in several housebreaking and theft cases. CID is conducting further investigation. Suspect is being interrogated at the moment. The search operation at the site of the devastating landslide in Media Bad the Koslanda ended this morning. Minister of Disaster Management Mahinda Amarivra said that the number of persons who went missing as a result of the landslide stands at 37. 13 bodies have been recovered so far. There is more to the final report. With the number of persons victimized by the landslide at 37, a total of 27 persons have been deemed missing. We have decided to establish a memorial at the location and declare the area a reserve. Commander of Security Forces Central Major General Manu Pereira, who was coordinating the search operation, said that steps have been taken to subject the armed forces who were involved in the search and recovery operation to a medical checkup. We decided to end the search operations at the Miria Badda area today. As the second step, we have decided to put the armed forces personnel who were involved in the search operation through a medical checkup. Since there was a threat of the security personnel being exposed to harmful and hazardous germs while at the site, we have decided to put them through a medical inspection. The security personnel will be sent to their respective units after verifying their medical reports. Major General Mano Pereira said that the construction work on the dilapidated Poonagala Koslan the road will conclude today. Meanwhile, speaking to News First, the shaman of the Mahamuni Hindu temple, who was reported to be missing by the landslide, expressed the following views. <laughs> I am the Pusari for the temple in this area. They claimed that I was dead and were looking for me and even the newspapers said that I was dead. Individuals who had been displaced after losing the houses to the landslide renewed requests for houses. We have found a suitable land in the Ampitya Khanda area. We have decided to build 57 houses in the first phase of the project. It has been reported that there are 29 persons more. We won't just idle around. We will grant money and pieces of land to build houses. I have given instructions to start constructing the destroyed Coville and the milk factory over the next two weeks. The construction will get underway with the assistance of the army personnel. <laughs> In Urli and Badula, Kegol, Ratnapura, the Tamil speaking people living in one eight feet room, father and mother, son and wife, sister and husband. So there are three families living in one eight feet room. Sixty years back, when under white people ruling, the British is ruling, only husband and wife is living in, only two people living in the lion room. Today, what happened after sixty years? Everybody talking about Sri Lankan tea, Ceylon tea, Ceylon tea. But we should see the conditions of people they are living in this kind of lion room. The government thinking that giving deputy ministers and ministers it will be satisfy the people's need. No. We will satisfy the grievances of people. We should satisfy the people's right. There are no proper health facilities. There are no proper education facilities. Even they don't have the privacy. But when now they are trying to distribute houses, how are they going to distribute? Only the father. So what's going to happen? The son and the wife and the sister and the husband. They should get, each and everybody should get uh, houses. See, in Aurelia, all the all the fellows are ministers and deputy ministers. If you see the Badula, all deputy ministers and ministers. In previous government, there are six deputy ministers from the state Tamils. Six of them are lost. They should address the grievances of people. Up next is Action TV.
the 39th Auditor General of Sri Lanka who held the position for three years, including the first year where he functioned in an acting capacity, retired on the 31st of October. Until his retirement, he had failed to locate a misplaced audit report compiled by the department, which raises allegations against him as well. The report in question had been submitted to his predecessor by the committee which compiled it. This predecessor continues to receive an allowance today as the head of a project undertaken by the Auditor General's Department with funding from the World Bank over the past four years. The Training and Development Center of the Auditor General's Department opened in Ratnapura on the 29th of October, well before its completion, represents one part of the project being undertaken with the World Bank funding. The 39th Auditor General, who failed over three years to locate the misplaced report, which also implicates him, was also responsible for another notable action or inaction in his time frame. The inaction in question was the non-payment appointment of an officer to fill a vacancy for a Deputy Auditor General. Given that the position became vacant when he advanced to the position of the 39th Auditor General, the neglect in appointing a replacement is all the more notable. By failing to call for interviews and depriving a talented official the opportunity to advance to the position of Deputy Auditor General, the 39th Auditor General has done a disservice to the department. An internal communique shows that the unprofessional policy of appointing persons to high positions in an acting capacity has been continued through the appointment of the 40th Auditor General too in an acting capacity. Incidentally, the misplaced audit report commissioned by the 31st Auditor General with the intention of upholding the reputation of the department also applies to the 40th Auditor General. Tomorrow, we'll look how the current Auditor General has employed his professional skills as a professional accountant. The expenditure heads of the Ministries of Children's and Women's Affairs and Parliament Affairs were taken up for debate in Parliament today. This budget talks about women's development, economic situation and rights, but the reason behind this... That's right. As much as they talk about women, we can see that the government has become afraid of women. This will be even more apparent in the time to come because there is talk going around with regard to women contesting the upcoming election. But I'm sorry to say that the budget allocation for your ministry has not been given justice as opposed to what has been written. ोजने <laughs> संशोधनेंगणी संग्रह they are asking as to why women are not involved in politics honorable chairman if there are 13 women in parliament who are like this what would happen if you had 25 more i would like not 25 but 30 to enter this chamber but if we look at elections carried out at the provincial level we have to force women to join us they do not like to represent i have analyzed society and i believe honorable chair that most of the women who oppose me here are women who have loved 10 or 12 men <laughs> In business news tonight, prices of vegetables at the local market have seen a drastic increase. There has been an increase in the prices of produce from the hill country, including that of carrots and leeks by 120 rupees per kilogram in comparison with last month.
The price of a kilogram of carrots in leeks, which was at 110 rupees over the past one month, has increased to 240 rupees a kilogram at present. When news was made inquiries pertaining to this, it was revealed that other varieties of vegetables were priced at 40 to 60 rupees per 250 kilograms. That was whether destroyed all the vegetable crops. That is the reason why we see a dearth in the number of vegetables that are brought to the market. This is why the produce is purchased for an exorbitant price. Thriving traders who come to the Dambul Economic Center are the ones who are not at a disadvantage. The book My Pen, My Weapon or N. Elitayadam, authored by senior Tamil journalist N. Vidyadharan, was launched in Colombo yesterday. The event was graced by a distinguished gathering, including political figures and veteran journalists. Uh, I had been in the journalistic field, especially during the vote, vote on of this period, about uh, three and a half decades. My experience as journalist, I have written a book and I have named it uh, My Pen, My Weapon. And uh, I think that it will elaborate how I managed to uh, handle all these issues and how we overcome all these a crisis and how we managed to publish the newspaper. The war is over and there has been a significant change of chance by the TNA and the Tamils. The acceptance even before the 2009 of the 13th amendment, though the government had promised that they go beyond the 13th amendment at the moment, everyone says it is going to the 13th amendment. The acceptance of a unitary state, the acceptance of the recommendations of the lessons learned and reconciliation commission. But unfortunately, there has been no adequate response to this by the government. Now many of us, Sinhalese, Tamils, Muslims want a Sri Lankan identity. But why is it that the Sri Lankan identity is not being created? Because you can't have a country that is divided. The more you keep dividing it, the more problems you will have. Right to Information Act is an essential necessity today. And that is something that all political parties that are attempting to face a national election will have to pledge before the people. At least the enactment of the Right to Information Act would be one such piece of legislation that would ensure that governance in this country would be something that would be subject to probity and would ensure that corruption which has been one of the banes which all of us are trying to get rid of would be uh, at least to, to a great extent contained. The struggle to win our rights was carried through violence. Today, such a situation does not exist. Five years have lapsed since the end of war. In the present environment, we must find an acceptable solution to the national problem which respects the rights of all communities within a unitary state. There is a need for devolution of powers which meets the aspirations of the people of the individual provinces while protecting territorial integrity. We must have governance which upholds our identity. This is our hope. Sports fanatics can cast their vote through SMS for the most popular sportsman of the Sports First Mobitel Platinum Awards. Six sportsmen were selected out of the multitude of applications that were received. Accordingly, 1. Mahalaja Wardana, 2. Lasit Malinga, 3. Angelo Mathibs, 4. T.M. Dilshan, 5. Kumar Sangakara, and 6. Manju Wanyarachi have been selected as the top six of the most popular sportsmen. You can cast your vote via SMS by typing SMPA space the number of the sportsman and sending it to double seven double eight. The voters also have the opportunity to win one hundred thousand rupees. The sports first Mobidel Platinum Awards night will be held on the thirtieth of November at Stein Studios, Rathmalana. Sports first Mobidel Platinum Awards. 
In quick news, captain of the Sri Lanka cricket team, Angelo Matthews, says that they were defeated by India in the ODI series because the batsmen did not perform at their best. He admitted that his team did not perform well. India sealed victory in the ODI series in Hyderabad yesterday, winning the third ODI by six wickets and claiming an unassailable 3 0 lead in the five match series. With the exception of Mahila Jayawardhan and Tilakaratna Dilshan, the Sri Lankan batsmen did not fare well before the Indian bowlers. At the post match media briefing, Skip Angelo Matthews revealed that Kumar Sangakkara will be rested for the next two games. We actually decided uh, a few days ago that Sanga will be going back. He's been rested. And we need to give opportunities to guys like Dinesh Chandimal, opportunities, get our strengths, weaknesses right. And, you know, going forward, we need to, you know, get the best batters out of, um, you know, to the World Cup. So we are experimenting a, a few things. And that's a look at primetime news for tonight. But before we wrap up, we leave you with some stunning visuals of two professional rope walkers who spent two years preparing for one of their most challenging feats crossing Zimbabwe's famous Victoria Falls. The falls, known locally as the smoke that thunders on the Zambezi River, carries more than 500 million cubic meters of water during the rainy season and the drop is about 100 meters to the canyon below. At their widest point, they measure about 1.7 kilometers. I'm Shane Silva. I'm Stephen Lazarus. Take care and good night.